Hello everyone uh, and welcome uh, to our today's uh, discussion about hate speech. Uh, to be precise, uh, we're going to talk about this book, uh, Ask Them, Hate Speech at the Service of Politics. And uh, this is a publication um, uh, of ELF, European Liberal Forum, and edited by Miłosz Hodon. Uh, I'm Jan Nałopat and next to me is Ludreno. Hi, uh, first of all, um, really happy to, to see you all, to meet you all today. And we are really honored, it's a pleasure for us to host uh, this meeting. As you, oh, most of us already know, the hate speech topic is a very, really wide, uh, broad one. Um, so today we have uh, five experts with us uh, in order to put some light on some of its uh, aspects that are discussed in the very book. Uh, so we have uh, five experts uh, coming from uh, Spain, uh, Greece, uh, Bul Bulgaria, Lithuania, and uh, Ireland. So I will start with the presentation. So we have uh, with us from Ireland, Miss uh, Uriemu Adejinmi, who, who is a councillor on uh, Longford County Council uh, and a deputy chairperson of uh, Longford Municipal District. She's also a national secretary of the Fianna Fail Women's Network. Uh, next person with us, we have Violeta uh, Davoliute from Lithuania, who is a PhD professor at Vilnius University Institute uh, of International Relations and Political Science, focused on the politics of memory and uh, the national identity and historical trauma. Uh, the next person is Dimitri uh, uh, Martin, sorry, Dimitrov from Bulgaria, uh, editor of Capital Quarterly and former correspondent uh, for the Balkan Insight and the Bulgarian Capital Weekly. He's also a member of the Association of European Journalists of Bulgaria and uh, uh, the co-founder of a bilingual website for student um, made school of journalism called School Media. <coughs> for also from Greece, we welcome uh, uh, Mr. Athanasios Gramenos from Greece. Uh, PhD research, fo research fellow at the University Library of Sacramento State University, um, project manager at the Friedrich Newman Foundation for Freedom in Athens. And uh, from Spain, we have uh, Anna uh, Juanate, PhD professor of the CEI International Affairs Center, affiliated to the Universitat de Barcelona, and uh, a part time professor at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra, coordinator also of the report. Uh, right-wing extremism among youth in Spain, current situation and perspectives, and also she's one of the founder of the Observatio Proxy. Yeah, thank you, Lud, for not uh, misspelling any Shout name. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so now let's start with a few words from Miłosz Hodun, uh, editor of the publication. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Lud, for this uh, for this. Welcome. So, uh, yes, on behalf of the European Liberal Forum, I would like to welcome you here at this launch event of our publication. European Liberal Forum, or ELF, is an official think tank and uh, political foundation of the, of the ALDE party, so uh, a liberal platform for discussion uh, where around 50 uh, member organizations from all over Europe gather to, to, to discuss uh, European values, freedom, and, and implement common projects to, to protect this, this European values, to protect the, the idea of, of common integrated Europe and, and of, of Europe of, of free citizens. And I'm here today in my, my, my double role because I am also uh, editor of, uh, as Joanna said, of the publication uh, called Ask Them Hate Speech at the Service of Politics, uh, which was a project we've been developing with uh, yeah, over, over 30 authors in 2020, over 30 authors from 27 member states. So in this publication, you can find texts about hate speech in politics uh, in every single European Union member state. So there's 27 texts. And you can see in this, this publication, you can use it as a little guidebook, as a little map on what hate speech in politics is in all these European Union member states. And you can see that hate speech is very different. Wherever you go, it exists. And this is, of course, devastating because this is a, a phenomenon that is omnipresent and it threatens all the achievements of liberal democracy. 
this this is one of the conclusions. But the other conclusion is that you can really see that hate speech is very, very different, and it is used by the politicians in a very different way in all uh, in every single European Union member state, and it's something very different. The definition and the way it influences uh, politics in Poland, Hungary, or Romania. And uh, it's something very different in Scandinavia or, or, or Spain and Portugal. And this is something we are going to discuss with our distinguished uh, guests, with our distinguished panelists. All of them are also authors in this publication. So uh, uh, my friend Lud uh, introduced all our guests, but I, I, I must add that, that all our five distinguished panelists have contributed with an article uh to to the publication so you can uh, you can read their pieces you can read their analysis uh in in the book the book is available uh at the website of the european liberal forum you can see the the email address or somewhere here uh down below in the section publications is is free to download and I, I encourage you to uh to download it to read it and 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 to discuss with us today uh during, during the, this panel discussion you can ask questions in the in the comment section on facebook live uh but also if you ask us any questions later on in private messages or on uh, or or below this this, this video uh I, I promise you that we will answer and if we can we will also uh, ask our our hosts our, our guests our contributors to uh to answer so i think without further ado uh I would like to invite you to this uh, to this discussion. Just let me say one more thing. If you would like to quote anything, post anything from this discussion, uh, please use use hashtag elf event, uh, which is our hashtag. And when you use this hashtag, you can find everything that European Liberal Forum uh, is doing online. So, uh, Joanna and Lud, the floor is yours. Yes. <clears throat> thank, thank you, you thank you. Uh, so before we have a little surprise for you, so uh, before we give actually the floor to our guests, uh, Asha and I were in charge of uh, creating some video contents uh, around the publication uh, uh, in order to as a, as a supplement uh, to the book. So um, we would like to 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 screen one of uh, one of our movie uh, now. So uh, enjoy. Being yourself is not your ideology. It is your identity. And no one can ever take it away. When I look around, we ask ourselves, where is the essence of humanity? when anti-Semitic carnival costumes openly parade on our streets? Where is the essence of humanity? When every single day, Roma people are excluded from society and others held back simply because of the color of their skin or their religious belief, and this reminds us that progress on fighting racism and hate is fragile. It is hard won, but very easily lost. So now is the moment to make change, to build a truly anti-racist union that goes from condemnation to action. The European visionaries decided that difference is not a threat. Difference is natural. Difference is the essence of humanity. As part of this, we will propose to extend the list of EU crimes to all forms of hate crime and hate speech, whether because of race, religion, gender or sexuality. Hate is hate and no one should have to put up with that.
All right, so this may last uh, a bit long. I hope you could uh, screen the, the movie. Uh, this, the movie was re well screened uh, at your place. It was jumping a little, but I hope you, you, you enjoyed the movie. Yeah, so hate is hate, and we all agree. And um, I have to tell you that um, in January, when uh, Miłosz called us asking uh, if we can make this series of videos, uh, we immediately said yes. For us, it was obvious that we wanted to uh, be a part of this project. Um, and at the beginning, uh, we knew that we have to ask ourselves, what is... Um, the hate speech, what is the definition of hate speech? And because of your book, we know the definition of hate speech, uh, but we still don't know the answer for the question, um, where does uh, the hate speech come from? And uh, this is our first question uh, to all of you. Um, where does the come, uh, hate speech come from? There is no particular order here, and anyone can start if, if, if you wish to, please feel free. Oh, Anna. Please, Anna. Uh, okay, good morning to everybody. Um, okay, I think um, it's a very relevant question. So, if we consider hate speech as a way of expressing prejudice against people uh, perceived as different, I think the, the origin of, of that is evolution, unfortunately. I mean, it's, I think it's a very good example of an evolutionary mismatch in the sense that during most part of human history, distrust, distrust of um, outgroups was a clear fun, but if you were in the forest and you would uh, bump into another tribe, it was a good idea to run away, right? Uh, it was good, uh, it increased the possibilities of survival. However, in modern multicultural societies, prejudice uh, may be and is uh, deeply harming as it may lead to uh, discrimination, hate crime, and, and even genocide. So I think this is a problem. I, I think it's wired, in a way, into uh, our way of thinking. I mean, prejudice is really wired in, in, into, into our way of perceiving uh, society. And unfortunately, also in the last years, uh, political groups uh, have uh, used this, uh, this uh, mechanism and they are exploding um, this, this prejudice or this uh, tendency to prejudicial thinking that uh, human have. have. So I think, uh, unfortunately, the origin is, is uh, evolution. So we have to be aware of that and we have to uh, fight uh, and, and educate people uh, since uh, early age uh, to think in a non-prejudicial way. Thank you. Does someone want to, to intervene on this question, please? All right, yeah. please, there will be more. Thank you. Um, I just want to add, um, in terms of um, hate speech, uh, it's uh, it, it's correct. It, uh, it came from the rise of uh, multiculturalism, and the focus was to highlight um, uh, to take the focus from criminal intent, uh, which is often after a crime has been committed, to utterances, to gestures, to conduct or writing uh, that were deemed prejudicial to individuals or groups on the basis of who they are. So, um, like we had uh, Ursula say, um, it's a based on their race, gender, their sexual orientation, their religion, and you know, um, people that were typically exposed to offensive language and uh, dehumanizing metaphors. So um, that is, is uh, why uh, hate speech and it is being, the awareness has been raised of, of hate speech because um, it's not when a crime is being committed that, you know, um, focus has to be made. It's how the victims are made to, to feel when they are targeted with these hateful rhetoric and that's why it's it's so important like what we're doing here is so important to raise awareness so that people are mindful of their utterances and how it affects others thank you very much does someone want to, to uh, please please violeta yeah um so as as it was already stated hate speech is notoriously difficult to define and i think 
politicians um, and the general groups that kind of promote this style of making politics or the style of communicating because it's of course a form of communication they intentionally kind of are always on the line between between what will be legally defined as hate and um and, and you know really are very skillful at already by now very skillful of not kind of remaining on this line. So I think when we think about this mode of communication, we have to really understand that this is, first of all, uh, an attempt to weaponize language, weaponize discourse, to use it as a weapon, um, uh, and also um, you know, to, as a weapon to score political points or some other points. And it is based on a very important um, aspect. It's, in, it's, it's based on agitation. It is meant to agitate, to, uh, to, uh, to somehow, um, uh, you know, to evoke danger, fear, insecurity, and so on and so forth. Um, now, this seems a bit abstract, but as we said, in different contexts, um, uh, you know, the style of using the hate speech or walking on this kind of, you know, along this thin line is very different. So I will just maybe, um, you know, thinking about my region, think about uh, the historical legacy, this speech of agitation, um, uh, you know, that has long historical legacy. It's it's what propaganda was about um, during the Soviet period. And when you when you think even further, let's say about a Nazi period. So in the areas where was this long term kind of propagandization, you know, the the regimes that use this kind of agitation, visual and verbal and so on. I think it really has this kind of special um, special capital there, you know, special cultural legacy, which interestingly enough um, is noticed, you know, more and more kind of universally. So I think we have to look at these components, at the, at the you know, the propaganda, the education, and at this weaponized form of discourse in order to understand the mechanisms of it. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Martin, yeah. <clears throat> Martin, you, would you yeah. like to add something? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I completely agree uh, with uh, the previous speakers and uh, about the complexity, especially about the complexity of uh, where uh, hate speech comes from. Uh, as I don't, as I kind of lack the, this academic long-term perspective of uh, hate speech, I can speak from the uh, perspective of a journalist uh, who has been observing uh, political process in Bulgaria, where I come from, and in the region um for quite some time and i would say that uh, another element that needs to be mentioned when we speak especially about eastern europe is the uh, negative effects of democratization and the fact that uh, after uh, 45 and in some other places uh, um, even longer uh, period of time uh, 45 years or even longer uh, without democracy or without any sorts of uh, um, Freedom of expression that uh, like the majority of population uh, had the pendulum, uh, the pendulum swung on the other side, like completely on the uh, in the other direction, and suddenly we have um, perception that everything is uh, kind of uh, allowed, like uh, everybody can just uh, spew hate or uh, talk uh, bad things about minorities or about whoever decide are their target without uh, facing any uh, repercussions because repercu repercussions even if they were legal repercussions uh, especially actually if they're uh, legal repercussions would mean impeding their uh, freedom of speech which was a no-no in the first uh, decades after the uh, change of regimes so uh, this sort of uh, this sort of uh, mm, uh, uh, we have a special word in Bulgarian, which is called Subudia. Uh, it's a bit more like it's, uh, freedom too much, we call it in a way, freedom without any rules or obligations attached to it. Uh, so with this freedom um, being abused, we are now in a situation in which uh, uh, the new technologies, uh, especially social media and the way, actually not the new technologies, but what new technologies like social media are capable of uh, constructing in the societal sphere, uh, basically a completely new aims of debate where everybody uh, uncensored can say anything, what they feel like, what they want, and it's very hard to uh, 
catch them and even if you catch them you're getting uh, punished uh, by regulators for impeding their uh, freedom of speech or uh, you know it's, it's very hard to kind of it's it's a quite a mayhem there uh, so we we are seeing now on a global scale uh, what we've been seeing in uh, post totalitarian eastern europe in a way uh, having uh, like uh, freedom that is so unbridled by any sort of limits that it uh, becomes um it starts having this sort of like dangerous connotations to it thank you very much and now Atanasius. Atanasius, would you like to can you hear me? to add please can you hear me well okay okay so um First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I want to thank the European Liberal Forum and uh, Milos for uh, uh, honoring uh, not only me, but also the co-author of our paper, which is who is not here with us today. It's Professor Vlasis Vlasidis from the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki. And I go straight to the question to say that uh, hate speech is a quite recent phenomenon in Greece. It's not something very, very old. We didn't have it before 1974. It was the end, the end of the dictatorship when the dictatorship of Greece fell in 1974 and uh, we didn't uh, although there was after that there was some after that incident there was some uh, marginal hate speech coming mainly from from some very small newspapers it was limited and um, without any prestige without any serious influence uh, any any diffusion in the society however modern hate speech in Greece is systemic in the sense that it comes from the channels of the political parties and it is a product of the sovereign debt crisis of 2009-2010, which reflects actually the wide and deep schism that we have in uh, the local political landscape. And it shows that uh, it's not just a spontaneous movement, but it can be controlled also by the politicians. I know that when we speak about um, uh, conservatism, when we speak about um, uh, authoritarianism, our mind usually goes to Orban or to Erdogan and the leaders of this style. But uh, we should also start thinking uh, the, the leaders who are in the shade of these ones. And you can take also the, the current uh, Prime Minister of Greece, I will come to this later in uh, the course of our discussion, to show how hate speech can be produced and populism, which is prerequisite for, for hate speech can be produced also via formal and uh, esteemed channels in, in the local countries and uh, in the rest of Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for Thank you all for all your input uh, into this question. To <clears throat> we try to, I think we now we see a little more clearly where uh, does it come from. And uh, as we lack of uh, academic background or academic studies about the origin of hate speech, it is uh, really hard to trace and to, 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 to come back to its really early beginning. So maybe I can try to sum up. Yeah, yes, I will, try to, I will try to sum up. I will add something. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so hate speech, let's say that it's related to prejudice, if I understood. And it's uh, really old, let's say, like from the beginning of humanity, when you have uh, tribes who had prejudice to uh, unknown uh, tribes. Uh, but also, uh, let's talk about Europe. We have a, a, a kind of legacy, and it's come nowadays really like a, a master uh, tool, a, a weapon, uh, made create to agitate to 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 create fear uh, for political uh, uh, most of all purpose. Uh, we can come back in the recent, not so long time ago, uh, when we talk about the propaganda, when we talk about the uh, the wars, the world wars that uh, ravages uh, 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 Europe. Uh, and nowadays, it's really like uh, 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 mastered. It's it's really a, a long cultural uh, legacy. Uh, it's, bec it's becoming like more and more, uh, there is a democratization of uh, hate speech and, and politicians know how to, to really uh, surf on the borderline, uh, yes, uh, between, uh, there is an altercation between, uh, when, we when it comes to uh, um, legal uh, um, repercussion, there is an altercation between hate speech and uh, uh, freedom of speech, yes, that uh, politician knows now how to play master, uh, there is a mastery of how to, to, to play with these lines. Uh, so <clears throat> nowadays when we talk about uh, hate speech, uh, we have in mind the rise of multiculturalism. So um, the people are also due to this legacy used to, to this uh, hate, more and more used to this hate, hate 
speech uh, 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 to this uh, hate speech, sorry, hateful speech, um, <clears throat> and also we have the rise of uh, new technologies that are uh, uh, that um, give access to almost free space, free space of free central censorship, sorry, uh, um, space in order for people to ex express to anyone. Now anyone can express uh, uh, thanks to. Um, Social media. So, as uh, as a result, we are here today, and uh, it's a, a little step, a little tears of water, in order to educate and to raise uh, awareness about the danger and the and the consequences of uh, of hate speech. Yeah. Um Actually, for me, it was very interesting that you have uh, so uh, different point of uh, point of views of like a historical point of view, um, the point of view uh, of Martin that is a, a journalist, and uh, it gives the idea uh, that uh, the sources of hate speech uh, are so wide, and this is also the problem. And uh, yes. yes, so that's why we will try now to uh, to narrow. Uh, be the debate. Thank you very much for uh, all the light you put. Now uh, it really helps us uh, because we want to to really dig the the the, the subject and to, to go into the roots uh, to go to the roots in order to to understand more. Uh, all right. So now <clears throat> we'll come in this part of our discussion. We'll come to more uh, um, focused questions, local questions, and we will start uh, individual questions. We will start with you, uh, um, Atanasios. So, in your article, you portrayed uh, Greece as an extremely divided uh, society when it comes to uh, political views. Where within the country, I read uh, in your article about uh, uh, extreme leftish, uh, extreme rightish, even extreme center, which is like uh, sounds a bit like nonsense and really like hard to believe. Yes, uh, a country where also at least there is one case of proven uh, political and hatred murder. Uh, a country where liberals are called traitors. So, would you mind to tell us about? Because when we had the interview, you told us about uh, that you were uh, like the victim of uh, hate speech, uh, an incident that occurred lately, where you were targeted personally in an article. Uh, could you could you tell us a bit uh, what motivated, in your opinion, this uh, this uh, hate speech addressed to you personally? And uh, is this apparent chaos, inevitable chaos? Is, uh, is inevitable in your country, if this chaos is inevitable in your country, political chaos. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I have new fish for you because uh, uh, two Sundays ago, uh, one of those yellow tabloids uh, the poli the polit of political extreme, far-right newspaper, called me uh, and the foundation in a two-page, at the center, in a two-page, uh, they dedicated two full pages on us, calling me uh, ethno-deconstructivist and uh, uh, extreme human rights activist and all the things uh, that you can imagine that they usually attribute to the left of the of the spectrum and uh, claiming that we want to destroy the uh, the nation state and all the other conspiracy theories that they're usually uh, reproduced by 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 the like of this uh, media. Uh, of course, this was a targeted framing. Uh, in the monitoring uh, accusation towards me, I assume that they want to send a message uh, against the liberals because the liberals have an individual voice. And the more we work here in Greece, uh, the more we attract new people who are very, very tired of this uh, great divide, this great schism between uh, the leftists of Syriza and the conservatives of uh, the New Democracy Party. Um, so um, this schism cannot be avoided, this polarization cannot be um, in a way controlled and um, returned somehow to normality, to a, to a public discourse of mutual respect, unless we have uh, a serious, a strong, uh, liberal, centrist poll that has no connections to one or another, is not playing games, I mean, because we had a party a few years ago, to Potami, the river, uh, which will appear to be a centrist party, but eventually it was a non-party without any certain ideological uh, Compass. Uh, actually, it was a, a, a personal party of the leader, a former journalist, a very famous journalist who tried to uh, flirt with the conservatives and have a sort of balance to, to counterbalance the um, sovereignty at, at that moment, the sovereignty of Alexis Tsipras, who was uh, a white radical leftist in the beginning. Now he has also compromised. So, um, as I say again, and I would like to pay attention to this, to, to, to underscore this clearly. Uh, hate speech is not coming only as um, 
as a movement of reaction by people who go into social media and when they don't like something they attack or and they they speak uh, very uh, aggressively it's also something coming from the, the system itself we know now we have seen it also in uh, some pieces in the newspapers it's it's it's, it's common long knowledge and um, we have evidence for this that the very political parties both Syriza and new democracy they have a branch a department of uh, uh, trolls, they, their own army of trolls, and they diffuse hate speech against the other, which means that the problem is in our democracy, I mean, we have a kind of democracy that we don't legalize, we don't recognize the legitimacy of the opponent. And this is traumatic. This doesn't uh, give us a promising perspective for the future. And it's something that we have to solve this, solve this with, with institutional measures. But this takes um, it, it takes courage, if I can say uh, this. So uh, I think more or less this is the, the, the image of Greece today vis-a-vis uh, -vis hate speech. Right. Thank you very much. I, I, as I assume that uh, uh, my question was almost two minutes, so it, I will, will give you more, uh, more, more, more time to, to, to answer. Yeah. So we, we can switch between, yeah, two, let's say, three minutes. That would be that would be I think fair. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now I have a question to Martin. Uh, Martin, um, after reading your text, I realized that uh, Poland and Bulgaria have a lot of in common. Uh, we have um, Kaczynski, uh, and you have uh, Mr. Simenov, uh, and then, and and I still don't know which one of them is worst one, uh, and I still don't know where is the situation, which situation in which country is. The worst one, um, but uh, I have uh, the impression that in Poland um, we are just like in Bulgaria that the hate speech and um, um, the way how the speech is, hate speech is used um, has became a norm. That's the new, as you uh, titled your text, that's the new normal. Uh, so you describe the system. I, I feel like it's like a um, closed system of hatred. And that um, it starts from the politicians that use the hate speech. And then from the politicians, uh, there are media uh, that are spreading the hate speech uh, and make it like give the, to the world more power, let's say. And uh, after that, we have the justice system that is uh, helpless. So I feel like it's closed circle. And my question to you uh, is how we can uh, get out of this closed syst uh, system, closed, uh, closed circle of hatred. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, I have no answer to this question. I can say that much, to be fair. Uh, what I can say is that um, you're completely right. It is a, indeed a circle of uh, hatred that is uh, fulfilled by every actor. Uh, just as uh, Dr. Gamenos uh, said earlier on, uh, you have uh, very similar uh, messages coming from all like points of the all parts of all powers of political forces and all sides of the political spectrum. Um, like, how can we improve it? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not really sure because we are seeing uh, this sort of uh, galvanization of uh, opinions in Bulgaria now that the political uh, parties are contesting uh, for the next. Uh, like the next election uh, which is coming in one month uh, we have uh, new sorts of uh, um, like uh, discourses that are not aimed at minorities or uh, even liberals or NGOs this time it's just like uh, spewing hate against each other uh, as uh, Milos very clearly and poignantly put in the introduction of the book um, basically we see a vulgarization of political discourse this is the Problem that we are facing, like uh, um, for like for some reason, maybe it's social media, maybe it is the way that uh, discourse developed in our societies in the past couple of decades. But we are seeing uh, that everything is accessible. Uh, sorry, uh, everything is allowed uh, nowadays. Uh, like saying almost everything is allowed. And uh, um, what is the answer to this? I'm not sure. 
definitely some sort of a, a betterment in terms of education would help for the next generations. But when I'm looking at Bulgarian Facebook comments, it's not the young people who are the most hateful. It's the older generation who are uh, the newcomers to uh, social media, for example, and not uh, the digital natives. Uh, in terms of practical solutions, uh, right now we have a slightly positive news in Bulgaria uh, coming from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, a few weeks ago, I'm not sure, I think three weeks ago, uh, the court uh, announced a verdict um, in which uh, it is uh, saying that the Bulgarian court has uh, not done what it should have done uh, when uh, so looking into a case of uh, hate, inciting hate. Uh, by uh, another far-right politician called uh, Volen Sidorov. He used to be in a coalition partner with Valery Simeonov. Then, like, they weren't together. They're actually uh, God, God, his, uh, Valery Simeonov is his godfather from his wedding. It's this sort of a broken style politics. But basically, this other guy who is uh, the, one of the original far-right uh, politicians in Bulgaria, um, uh, he, not him, but the judges that uh, ruled him out, um, uh, say that uh, the European Court of Human Rights said that they shouldn't have ignored the way that he speaks and he should have gotten a sentence. Uh, so, you know, I think that for some, for the from the legal perspective, definitely there are ways uh, through the European uh, Court of Human Rights to at least uh, rectify the uh, poor track record of the judicial system in pursuing hate speech. How far would uh, this go? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, in the, the Bulgarian judicial system is notoriously broken. I'm not sure that uh, even uh, this change of practice that the European Court of Human Rights is uh, advocating would uh, actually make a difference in the, uh, at least in the medium and short term until uh, the potential reformation of the court system. So uh, I can say as much. Uh, we have this uh, pressure from the EU. We have some pressure from NGOs, which uh, uh, is finally coming to uh, like, for, for, like uh, they're fruitful uh, results in, like uh, nowadays, uh, but in general, I'm not like, overly optimistic that uh, we'll get uh, less hate speech in Bulgarian politics anytime soon. Um, it occurred. It, uh, it occurred to me that uh, you wrote in your text that no one is hate from hate speech, even the main abusers. So uh, it closed the circle even more. And uh, from this uh, very pessimistic and um, from the darkness of Bulgaria, we come to Lithuania. And uh, Violet, I have the question for you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I like the title of your text, A Line uh, in the Sand. And uh, I interpret it this way, that the sand is what is uh, current and uh, under it, very uh, shallowly, lies historical memory. And um, uh, this is the problem if, if, uh, in Lithuania, I guess. And this is the first part of my question. And the second is that um, um, that um, you described the situation of the October uh, 2020 and the last elections. And you wrote exactly that populist parties have sprung up in the recent years and months. Uh, so, what exactly happened at that time? What happened that uh, uh, they uh, sprang up and then uh, they um, lost the elections? Thank you for your question. So, first of all, I would start, um, I will quickly describe this image of the sand. So, actually, it's not only a metaphor, but um, it really was uh, an experiment by uh, Mayor of Vilnius City. And in the central square where, um, you know, Formerly, uh, Lenin used to be placed, and it, it has a long historical, historical long history of the square. But you know, during the Soviet period, which lasted for a long time, it was considered to be kind of the central square. And then, for a long time, there was a debate what should be there, and there are you know national colors there. There were a lot of debates about what kind of monument should be there to the medieval Lithuanian knight or maybe anti-Soviet partisans and so on and so forth. And then um, uh, during the summer after the kind of first wave of pandemic closure, um, there was a decision taken to make this, you know, kind of minuscule, really small sand beach, which was called 
open beach and then right there and uh, at the place where you know which had this historical significance but also there are there is a KGB museum not far from it and that also former Gestapo and so forth anyway so it's a very serious historic very um um, very significant, I meant to say, historical place. And so the debates that started there um, uh, during that time before the elections were overwhelming. And, um, and uh, that's why somehow this little sand beach became kind of the center for my piece. Now about, the, about these populist parties that kind of sprung up and were very, very present, very, very visible, especially especially for those who follow social media, and then um, eventually did not come out so successfully. You know, for the elections, you know, one is never sure of how, like, where even with the elections now, uh, where the populist parties did not really do so well, one sees this very kind of strong presence in the pub public space all the time so meaning that one what is somehow the presence of something happening of that transformation as it was mentioned before in the in the public space this you know war not only against certain certain politicians although as i said the the you know uh, minorities certainly is is the target of that kind of discourse but just the the hate somehow the the agitation in the in the debates in the rhetoric is is just part of the daily um of the daily kind of i don't know the daily um existence and the and the populist parties they come from the you know various social movements of all kinds they reconfigure themselves some of the politicians end up in the mainstream parties but then they up you know they they create their own group of supporters and then this very kind of vibrant um, um you know presence of um of of the, this kind of rhetoric and this kind of style of politics suggests to me that is actually going somewhere so that the current that the current victory or the current um or the current configuration um of political forces is really not the end and um so what i want to say is maybe my ending of this piece was a little bit too optimistic somehow we have a new wave of debates and they are actually discouraging precisely the style of argument the 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 hate you know uh, it's it's somehow it's it's changing the public space it seems but and that is to conclude maybe this is because and pandemic really has something to do with this maybe this is because really of the seclusion and the you know just kind of splashing of emotions on social media maybe this is not and not only social media also the regular media as well maybe this somehow will you know it never you know will kind of evaporate and this will not basically you know turned out to be as significant as it seems the hard the, the, the hard part is is really hard to analyze these very ephemeral processes but i for sure can say that agitation uh, and hate or something on the on the borderline is is very much in the in the you know in the in, in the discourse in the public discourse and um also uh, that's really the last thing I really like the remark about the gender division. I would agree that the older generation uh, or middle-aged uh, users of social media, Facebook and so on, play a very significant role in it. And we really need more research on how this actually operates. What are really the mechanisms? So, sorry if this was a bit too long. But, but but still optimistic, it's so a, thank you. It's okay, yeah, we will keep the light, the optimistic light that <laughs> yeah. you, you wrote in your article. So, okay, um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Violeta. And now, uh, Anna, please. Uh, so, in your article, you wrote about the Spanish historical uh, context, yes? So, which, if I understood, uh, could explain why, since the, the end of the dictatorship of Francisco 
uh, 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 Franco and the, uh, in 75 and the ratification of the uh, Spanish constitution in 78 uh, that prevent uh, any far, far right uh, uh, party to obtain any seats uh, in the parliament or to be almost I invisible uh, in the uh, political, uh, Spanish political landscape. Uh, until 2018, when we have the, the Vox party uh, that became, that start, start to become more and more represented in, on the uh, Spanish political uh, uh, picture. Uh, in this very moment, as we talk, we, 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 we checked yesterday that uh, on their uh, Instagram account, they have like 630,000 almost followers. The, by the time you wrote the article, they were like, uh, it was like the number, if I'm good, if I remember good, it was 586, 586,000 uh, followers. So it's more, 50K more. So uh, why now? Why is such a popularity now? Oh, thank you for the question. It's a very difficult one. Um, researchers are trying to answer that question. Uh, I think um, it's important to, to start um, with the particularities of Spain, um, because uh, as I explained in the article, um, Spain is different from other Western European democracies because uh, the democracy uh, was not being the defeat of, of fascism. Um, so we had to wait until Francisco Franco, the dictator, uh, died in 75, as you, as you said. And since that moment, I think an important thing to know is that Spain has done very little to come to terms with its past in terms of historical memory. We still have more than 100,000 uh, people buried in, in mass graves in Spain and, and the government, the different governments uh, did really little to, to try to uh, investigate that. So, so I think the first problem, I think we have a problem with memory. This is um, the best uh, thing. But despite that, it's really a puzzle, uh, the fact that uh, since uh, the 70s until very, very recently in Spain, we didn't have a far right party, for instance, and really hate speech in politics was not uh, normal at all. I mean, I, there was, in general, political parties respected some boundaries uh, in, in, in political speech. So how it changed recently, because actually it, it was also surprising that during the very hard economic crisis in Spain, the situation continued the same. So we didn't have um, far right parties like um, uh, rising up during the economic crisis. Actually, this party box uh, uh, had for the first time political representation in, in 2018. So uh, I think why happened is a cocktail of reasons. Uh, I think the, the, the best, uh, the, the first idea, it's the influence of other countries. So I, I mean, we, we are seeing the rise of, of uh, uh, far parties, far right parties in different countries. Uh, so even countries such as Portugal that didn't have uh, also uh, a party of these characteristics, uh, it's changing. So I think the, the international winds of change have also arrived to countries such as Spain, so that could be a, a factor. Another factor is social media. I think social media is helping also uh, political groups to convey uh, this message. And the third reason is, is I think, related with uh, the supply. I mean, the, 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 the supply side, the political offer in Spain, right? Because we didn't have a far-right party for a long time because we had the popular party, which is the main right-wing party in Spain, that really uh, included the whole spectrum of the rights. So uh, I think uh, the, the rise of this party, which is actually, uh, which was founded by uh, some politicians from the popular party very recently, I think it, it was this change in the political offer in Spain and this, the, uh, and, and this uh, um, right of this uh, party that is uh, putting uh, hate speech in the center of politics. Um, because before this, the popular party being a, a party that was able to control the whole spectrum of the right, um, was able in a way to uh, moderate the political discourse. But now we have another party that is actually um, trying to uh, put into the political discourse new issues such as anti-migration uh, discourse, such as an 
anti-feminist uh, discourse. So I think it's, the change is related with these uh, factors. But, uh, and, and again, the, my, my last point is that I think the lack of uh, anti-fascist culture in Spain and, and the, the, the lack of a liberal culture in Spain is now helping to thrive uh, this uh, this uh, hate speech in politics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And it was uh, really good. I appreciate you mentioned uh, the fact that besides of attack, terrorist attacks, uh, uh, crisis, there were still there was no uh, uh, big movement of uh, f from the far right. Uh, and, 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 and just now you have this popping, like uh, the trend that we, we observe in every part, different part of Europe. Thank you very much for your, uh, um, uh, for your answer. So now, uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. So now, uh, so let's come, let's talk a little bit about uh, Ireland. Uh, I'm sorry for spoiling, but uh, uh, when I, after reading your, your article, two things really stayed in, uh, in my mind. The first thing is that back then, in 1989, there was uh, an act called the Prohibition of Incitement of, uh, to Hatred Act it, that was already in effect back then. And the second thing is that um, during the general election of 2020, that community groups and civil society united and, uh, and, and let's say forced major parties to, to endorse the Irish anti-racist election protocol. So which is in uh, other words, a, a hate speech free election, yes? Uh, I, would, I would say that in, uh, if it was in uh, uh, other countries in Europe, many candidates couldn't work, run anymore if they had to, to endorse this protocol. Uh, so is Ireland a pioneer into, in, uh, of the hate speech free societies and what are the weaknesses of such an avant-garde situation? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if we're pioneers um, on ground. It certainly seems that um, we're still having a, a hard battle to, to tackle hate speech. And if I refer back to the uh, prohibition of incitement to hatred act in 1989, the, the biggest issue with, um, with the act is that um, it's, it's, um, it's a prohibition from incitement to hatred. So if, um, if there's no incitement to hatred, then no crime has been committed. So, you know, like that people, like one of the speakers said uh, earlier, people are getting very smart in in just stopping um, prior to their speech or, or their actions being tagged a crime. So that was the problem with, with that act. It, it was just once there's no incitement to hatred, it's assumed that no crime has been committed. So there isn't consideration to, uh, to the victim and the impact of that uh, hate rhetoric on the victims. So that's why the, um, we saw with the last election where high profile uh, politicians were using that again to target, to, to create division in communities. And a lot of it, like uh, uh, previous speakers have said, were mainly targeted at uh, minority groups uh, in society. And, you know, it just made uh, communities polarized and and there was just unnecessary um hatred being thrown around and you know whatever issues that we uh, encounter in the in communities straight away minority groups are blamed for it or or being held liable and you hear uh, people being told to you know go back to their country you don't belong here you know and you, you People are, that are born here, that were raised here, just because you know they are regarded as, as different, they they are being targeted by who they are, and politicians were uh, were hinting on that to to gain popularity and 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 win uh, votes at that time. So that um, that protocol was was very timely during during the elections. Now um, there is. Um, there's work in progress to to come up with um, uh, uh, 
the, the bones of a bill that will will lead to legislation that's actually fit for purpose that actually targets um the 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 perpetrators of hate speech so we don't wait till you know a crime has been committed or people are incited to hate and um, because the it's it's now going to focus on the victims and how they feel so um if if anybody is identified as a victim then you know, it's it's linked to to a crime being committed. So, um, work is in progress. Hopefully, that um, that that comes into it, it. It's signed into law, because um, as we've already articulated, um, hate speech is a menace to our democratic values. It it challenges um, it challenges peace and uh, and stability. And if unchecked, it then progresses from. Uh, from bias to acts of bias to um, to discrimination to to acts of violence, and then it can even uh, escalate to genocide. So it is very uh, it's, a, it's a terrible menace, and we're feeling it in in Irish society. And I think it was Martin that said, "Now people are just um, throwing hate at each other," and we're seeing that uh, a lot, especially on on social media. Um, you know, people aren't mindful of their of their comments and how and how it's been it's been um, received. And there was actually an, an instance where um, there was a football a, a a teenager in Ireland was playing a um, uh, was playing a football game on um, on a, what you call it now video game, and he lost. And then he targeted um, Ian Wright, uh, who is a, a retired footballer in the UK, with and just spewed bile at him. And so this um, this teenager was uh, was charged to, to to court because of that. Now. Since all that happened, obviously he was um, overcome with emotion. Like obviously, hate is 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 an emotion. So, but he um, afterward he 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 regretted his actions and he apologized to to Ian Wright. Ian Wright accepted the apology. And what happened when his case was brought up in court? The the judge said, "Well, he has apologized, and Ian Wright has accepted the apology. There's really no value or uh, nothing to be gained by uh, giving him a criminal conviction, and he was given a community service." And I think what the judge failed to realize is there needed to be a strong message that hate speech is not tolerated. Hate speech is not welcome in society, and that was missed. And I suppose the perception might be that, um, Asher, when you apologize, everything is fine, which isn't the case. And it it just you know even Sa'ir Wright um, tweeted that he was just he was just tired and he was weary. If this was ever going to be going to be decisively handled, because you know. This is an age long issue and we keep, you know, talking about it and highlighting it. And it seems like nothing is going to be done. But I suppose where where there's life, there's hope. So we have to hope that um, there will be legislation that actually targets um, targets the issue um, that addresses these, uh, these hate speech. And uh, hate speech really essentially is hate crime. Um, and if we have the appropriate legislation, I think we'll be able to to really move on and and start the battles to really diminish um, hate speech, so that everybody has, you know, people are afraid of going on social media. I see so many people, you know, declaring that they're leaving Twitter because it is just toxic, and you know that's such. A, I'm, I'm sure it's happening all over Europe and and all over the world. Like it's it's just so, uh, and and I do see these uh, the the young generation uh, things, Gen Z and the and the council culture, and they just have absolutely no tolerance for uh, for hate speech. And if anybody, like if if there's any historical evidence of anybody, be politician or celebrity or um, or an influencer that has, you know, um, uh, that has put out any any hate related material, they get cancelled straight away. I don't know about uh, cancel culture and its impact on on people, but I think you know Gen Z is showing us that there is a way of decisively tackling um, hate speech, and um, hopefully we'll we'll get to that point where we have 
we indeed we did need legislation we need uh, punitive policies to make sure that anybody that that goes about um propagating hate speech and inciting others is is brought to book thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much uh, thank you all for your insights uh, uh, when it comes to to hate speech and your contribution to uh, to the book uh, we are uh, short but if you talk if we when it comes to time uh, but we we can um, be longer we can continue our we debate have still 10 minutes. we have 10 minutes and no. uh, as we are we are having uh, receive we are receiving actually uh, some uh, questions from the audience. Some questions from the audience. So we will try to ask uh, 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 one. There, there, are, there are a few, very interesting. But we start uh, with the first one. We we'll start with uh, the first one. From Joanna Elman. Right. Is there anything we can do to stop online haters? Um, who wants to answer, maybe? Yes, it was. May I jump in? Yes, yes please. Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think this is a very, very critical question. It's, it's an extremely accurate question and uh, timely put because um, the challenge of the next years will be how to technologically uh, put some rules and then uh, try to prevent this hate that uh, it's really uh, annoying and of course it hurts our democracy, it hurts our personal relations. It's, it's really, it's, it's a very bad thing. Um, there has been a discussion uh, starting with uh, the, the famous ban on uh, Twitter's account of uh, former American President Trump. And uh, this um, ignited the discussion whether uh, um, uh, a social medium is uh, authorized, is legalized to ban someone. Some people say, well, it is a private company, they can do whatever they want. Some others say, and I, I incline to this uh, uh, opinion that um, it remains a public space, public sphere, and uh, it's like uh, television um, um, and uh, radio. It, the internet is also a public sphere, and we as liberals should protect this uh, access to all citizens, whether we like them or not. And there is nothing connected me with the former president, ideologically, I mean, with the former president of the United States. But it could happen to anybody. Uh, this uh, period, I mean, the last days, we have a huge uh, uh, campaign of censorship on Facebook accounts because we have some trending political issues in Greece here, a couple of, a couple of them, that they have again divided the political land, uh, landscape. And uh, we have Facebook uh, banning the, the accounts that they are not favorable to the government. So uh, I come again to say that th there is a problem here. There is a very deep problem. So um, I will... I will reproduce only an idea that came under, uh, after a, an article published uh, in, uh, in the United States by uh, the very famous to all of us liberals, Francis Fukuyama. And he said that uh, instead of just banning and uh, um, deleting posts or blocking uh, accounts, we can just start uh, individualizing, uh, customizing the preferences for what we see and what we do. In this sense, when you are as big as Donald Trump or Joe Biden or, I don't know, someone very, very, very uh, prominent and famous, uh, you're not that famous anymore because uh, the users of these uh, applications can just uh, not see you. They, they're not interested, they can just not see you without blocking you. But then the algorithm is not made by Facebook or Twitter, it's made by me, it's made by the user itself. And it's democratic in this sense, according to, uh, to the author. And um, I think that um, this is the first step, but it has to be, uh, wh whatever we do, it must be uh, also a pan-European discussion. It should start with uh, the initiative of the political parties. I hope that ALDE will have the initiative in this, and then the Commission should regulate something. We, have all, um, we must all sit around the table and discuss it, and uh, to try to find the balance between um, the, the regulation, the law, and uh, freedom of expression. You know, these two, even when we don't like what we hear, um, every opinion is welcome, uh, as long as it uh, keeps a civilized manner and it has something deeply political to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, as we are really short on the time, uh, I will give you, Anna, uh, one minute. 
But just before, I would like to say that uh, after uh, the intervention of Anna, we will ask the, our panelists, our experts, to answer to the questions uh, of meeting, of discussion. We have, because we have the other questions very interesting in yeah, common. We have, so. Yeah, we have one last also, yeah, question. Uh, yeah, we'll have one, one last question for you. So we will ask you of uh, meeting to answer to the different questions that have been asked uh, in, the, in the chat, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, so please, Anna, I will give you one minute, please. Thank you very much. I will be really fast. Um, I mean, I, I generally agree uh, with what uh, Atanasio said. Uh, so I think social media companies, they are um, being a little bit more ambitious in that they speech. This is good news, but I think we have to go uh, beyond just eliminating uh, hate speech. So just I wanted to mention um, some interesting preventing mechanisms that I think uh, it could be a good idea to, to implement, uh, particularly from the point of view of um, social media. And it's, for instance, uh, it was um, proposed uh, the possibility that before joining a social media platform, uh, you should have to do a very little course, I mean, a, a 10 minutes course about what is hate speech and about the consequences of hate speech. Uh, that I think that it could be interesting uh, because a lot of people, they, they are not aware of what is uh, hate speech and they use it uh, without thinking of it. And also the idea of uh, before posting a message online, um, it could pop, uh, uh, pop up a window uh, if it identifies denigrating language saying, are you sure you want to post this message? This could be the hate speech by the platform, for instance. So I think these mechanisms, uh, prevention mechanisms, could be very interesting because they also put the focus on the human rights obligations of uh, citizens, right, uh, beyond uh, the case of social media companies that, of course, will have uh, the obligation to prevent hate speech. I just wanted to mention that. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, one minute ten, so uh, uh, good timing. Uh, <laughs> So uh, now, as I said, uh, you will, I will ask you to, to stay after, off meeting to, to answer the questions to, to, our, to our audience, uh, asked by our audience. Uh, we are almost uh, finishing our meeting. Unfortunately, it would be good to, uh, we, if we would have like half an hour more about anything. And uh, as they said, every good thing has an end. So I will have one last question uh, uh, for you. Uh, I think we will have, uh, if everyone wants to talk, it will be 30 seconds per person, or 40. Uh, and the question is, uh, what message the rise of hate speech uh, conveys about the current states of our democracies? This will be my last question for you. I know it's, it's a hard one, so yeah. Take five seconds. Okay, please. Maybe I can start. Well, um, to, if I can be very brief, it would be, uh, it says that they're normal. Like in every uh, democracy, there is uh, pluralism. And uh, just because uh, we kind of agreed uh, or have agreed in, uh, the, in some period of history about what is the middle ground and what uh, shouldn't be, what steps shouldn't be crossed, uh, at the same time, having uh, these sorts of varying opinions, even if they're extreme, means that we still have a plurality of voices. And uh, this comes with its pluses and minuses. If we can control it a bit better and uh, uh, breaks where it's needed, I think it would be great. Uh, but at the same time, if we completely lose it, it will definitely not be uh, for, for a good reason. Thank you. Thank you very much. You made it 30 seconds. It's perfect. So uh, please, uh, do, you have, do we have someone else who would like to add something? May I add something, please? A final statement. Yes. Sorry, I, have mon I think I have monopolized uh, the discussion with my interventions, but uh, something very, very fast following uh, all the very, very nice uh, and very accurate uh, comments of the previous speakers. And I thank them for this very good and fruitful discussion. I want to, to note my personal view is that um, um, the, the current state of uh, hate speech and the current uh, state of uh, the rules of the political discourse shows that our democracies, the Western democracies, are in crisis. 
which means that although we all accept uh, um, uh, hate speech as an endemic phenomenon in the public discourse, and which is also connected to the very nature of the social media and the anonymity and the things that they work like this. However, we are in 2021 and we have the bar very low. It is an imperative for all of us if we want to live in the future in a, in a free and open society, in a liberal democracy, not just a majoritarian system, but in a liberal democracy with a deep, a very deep essence, like we know it from ancient Athens. It's a, it is time to take robust measures and do something. Uh, it's, it's an interdisciplinary, of course, approach that we have to follow, but politicians and, and experts have to come together because I believe our democracies are in crisis. And we have to act now because it's very late. Take Germany, they have alternative to Deutschland. That's, there is a problem over there. We have Hungary, we have Poland, of course, we have Turkey. I believe that we have also to include Greece in this systemic crisis. And of course, uh, other countries, more or less. So it is, it is a critical point, but it is a critical point not only for our politics, but also for the system of democracy, which we have to protect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for <clears throat> our expert and, <clears throat> and co-authors. Sorry of the uh, of this of this publication. It was nice to hear you and see you, and of course read your text. Yes, thank you to the to the audience uh, for your uh, attention and your time. Uh, thank you for to Miwash to uh, that. Uh, Helped us uh, that brought this uh, put for putting this publication sorry uh, uh, together. Uh, please, to our audience, uh, read uh, this publication. I think it's a great one. As you you have a sample today of our experts, uh, uh, and they know what they're talking about, and they do it with passion. And they, it's a needed job, as uh, as Atanasio said. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, so thank you once again, uh, uh, and I really hope to we really hope to to discuss. Uh, again, because the uh, discussion I think is needed. Uh, and thank you very much for your time, presence, and expertise today. Thank you. Thank you.